had some interesting conversations. Um, I was really thrilled to be able to find someone who is doing this kind of work. I know that uh, in Europe and other places, there's a lot more activity in this kind of thing, and you don't often get a chance to hear about it firsthand in this country. So please give a warm welcome to Mark Macy. Thanks, Diane. And thank you all for coming. I uh, have a lot of pretty incredible, mind-boggling information to share today. And I can attest to the validity of it. I, I know I think I've become friends, or it was friends, with uh, the researchers in Europe who were getting these contacts. Um, a lot of them have already died. Uh, they're starting to contact us from the other side, even. But, um, so anyway, I'm glad you came. Well, God was looking down on the earth recently, and things seem to be a little more unruly among the humans. So God assembled a team of angels to go down to the earth and do a survey. And they went down, did a quick survey, and came back up and said, that's right, God, we found that uh, things are becoming a little bit more unruly among the humans. We found that 90% of the people are behaving kind of badly, and only 10% are being really good. So God thought for a moment, what can I do to give hope and encouragement to this small 10% of the people who are trying to be good? I know, I'll send them an email. <laughs> so you know what that email said? I was hoping somebody knew I didn't get one either. <laughs> as far back as I can remember, I was always an atheist or an agnostic. Uh, thoughts of God and afterlife seemed like wishful thinking to me. But then in uh, 1988, I was diagnosed with cancer. And with death staring me in the face, suddenly I had to know. You know what really happens to us after we die. I couldn't take it on faith, not that there was anything wrong with faith. Uh, but I'd always needed some kind of proof or a good solid evidence to convince me of something that was beyond my understanding. And the afterlife was certainly beyond my understanding. So, in the course of healing, in 1991, I went to a conference in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, I ran into an old fellow named George Meek. Uh, George was the father of ITC, or instrumental transcommunication. It's the use of technology uh, to get information from the other side in the form of voices, images of a text through technical equipment, uh, TVs, radios, telephones, computers, and that kind of thing. But George had some amazing things to share at the conference. He said his wife, Jeanette, had died the previous year, and shortly after getting settled in on the other side, she sent George a letter to a computer. Now, the letter came through a computer in Europe while George was on the North Carolina, and had three very personal uh, incidents from our life together. One of them had to do with a box of books that had shipped to Ann Valentin in California, but the books got lost and shipped it. And re when they received the box, it was full of Harlequin novels. A second item had to do with a yard light that they had installed in their backyard for a, an outrageous sum uh, by, by a local electrician. And the third item had to do with a house key that they lent to their tenant, Debbie, who had lost her key. Uh, now, these three incidents had, they were of no interest to anyone, really, not even to George, except that they proved conclusively that Jeanette's mind and memory were still alive, and, um, and she had her full faculties about her physical body. And that's what George was trying to do since retiring from industry. Uh, he was trying to convince the world, I guess, that uh, there is no death, that we live forever, and it's just a transition from one state to another. Uh, he said that Jeanette also sent him a, a picture from the other side, showing the paradise world that she was living in now. Uh, the woman on the left face is Jeanette Meek, and the young woman in the dark dress is their daughter, Nancy Carroll, who died at the age of two weeks. And when the two of them became reunited on the other side, Nancy Carroll came to her as a baby again, an infant. She was delivered to Jeanette. And meanwhile, Jeanette was growing to the prime of life from an old woman. And the baby 
quickly grew to the prime of life. Uh, so, and so that everybody in this paradise world lives a prime of life between age 25 and 35. Um, it was a very healing time for Jeanette. We lost her baby at two months, and, or two weeks, I guess, and by the time left it all in her life. So it was a very healing time, which is something we all go through quickly in this paradise world. The man on the right is Hal Roach, the TV, an Hollywood producer from the 40s and 50s. They didn't know each other in the lifetime, but um, they seemed to resonate at the same vibration, so they wound up in the same paradise world. What is this picture? Well, this, this picture was, uh, the, well, the picture on the letter came through a computer in Europe. Uh, the, the researchers would go to work in the morning, it was a couple, uh, they'd turn everything off before they left. Sometimes they'd get home and there would be uh, new files right on that art disk or computer which was now running. They'd turn it on by invisible hands, I guess, while they were gone. And there, uh, the files that contained text, like the picture, I should, like the litter, I showed them, contained, contained images in the form of JPEG files and TIFF files. Um, and there was a concerted effort by our spirit group to try to give us more information about what life is like on the other side. And I was really impressed by the picture and letter, but I couldn't, I wasn't sure if it was for real. It seemed so mind-boggling to me at the time. Uh, but George has an even more compelling evidence. He said that he and another man named Bill O'Neill had developed a device they call Spiricom, short for Spirit Communication. Uh, Bill O'Neill would stand in front of the Spiricom device, and he would talk to people under the side of the veil. Uh, the way that you or I might stand in front of the speakerphone and talk to someone on the, on the other side of town or on the other side of the Atlantic. And this is what the spirit comes sound like. That's me at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm in a family talk, and he's like, but, um, where are at with Dealey's? Uh, this is a good white time. Hey, Bob, they already know where I'm in the end of the year. Who the guy's head was in your head? The third dude? He's saying, find to know I said you're a shirt. Sure. You love your beard, way, not you. These are you can carry our personalities across <laughs> to the other side, too. Uh, there were a lot of fascinating, actually about 20 hours of dialogues between Bill O'Neill and his spirit friends, mostly with Doc Mueller, uh, over a period of four years. And it was captured on tape. So I thought, you know, if this is for real, if, see if he's really getting this kind of contact from the other side, there must be something to this afterlife. George said that wasn't the end of it either. He said that one day he went down to his basement lab with a 35 millimeter camera and a tripod, and he set up the camera to take pictures, a series of about 200 pictures automatically under special lighting. So George was sitting in the chair under this special lighting, and he had, he had an out-of-body experience, which he captured on film. You can see the projection of the energy body, and uh, it's proverbial silver cord. And you can see right through his physical body, which becomes totally transparent. And he said he replicated this on another occasion. And this time, this physical body was only partially transparent, and you can see through his legs. But again, you can see a projection of the energy body and proverbial silver cord. So there were a lot of interesting people at that conference in 1991, and they were sharing a lot of interesting things. But it was George Meek's acting life research that really just about knocked me out of my chair. It changed my life. So I started to contact George Meek and uh, kind of tested myself for several months. I'd write to him, I went to visit him a couple times, and uh, we became close friends. And uh, he said, Mark, what I'm doing is nothing. He just said what researchers in Europe are doing. So we arranged a uh, flight to Europe. And uh, what I saw there really changed my life forever. There was a couple in Luxembourg who uh, invited me to their home where they had a set of radios tuned between stations. So just a low hiss of quiet noise filled the room. And we spent the afternoon just uh, drinking water and talking to each other, getting to know each other. And suddenly the sounds of the radio began to fade away as the voice of one of their, our spirit friends faded in. And he said, it can only work when the vibrations of those present are in complete harmony and when their aims and intentions are pure. 
Wir können rein. And then the spirit went on to address each of us in the room individually by name and give us each a personal message. And this is the one he gave to me. So that was my experience in Luxembourg. Uh, in Italy, there was a fellow named Marcello Bacci who had been using the same, he was using the same radio that he'd been using since the 1950s. And it was an old vacuum tube style radio. Uh, now guests would visit him and gather in his basement and they would talk to their deceased loved ones through Marcello's radio. And he told me that sometimes the spirits, the spirit friends would not only talk to him as guests, but also sing to them. And uh, this is a German man named Adolf Holmes. Adolf's mother died when he was just a baby, so he had a lifelong yearning to somehow get to know the mother that he'd never know on earth. And uh, it seemed like an impossible task or impossible dream until he heard about ITC, and then uh, he became infatuated with the research, and he became the adverse of it. He'd get up every morning and begin to experiment with his radios or televisions, and it wasn't long before spirit faces began to flash across his television cells, like this picture of his late mother. Now, apparently, at least Carol Holmes, after she died on Earth, uh, she got to these finer rows of spirit, and she had no interest whatsoever in the Earth. She'd pretty much forgotten about it, as many people do when we cross over, because life is so much different. It's like a dream left behind. Um, but his desire was so intense to have her back working with him. Some ethereal beings, who I thought about later, were angels, found her basically and invited her to come participate in the research with her son from Earth. As she agreed to do that, she became its chief collaborator after uh, all those years of being away from the Earth. Interesting story. Another face that uh, Eolf received on his television set belonged to Friedrich Jurgensen. Uh, Jurgensen was a pioneer in what's called EVP, or Electronic Voice Phenomenon. Um, back in the 1950s, after World War II, um, taping, audio taping became popular for the first time. Uh, people would take music and nature sounds and conversations, and sometimes they'd play it back and they'd hear these tiny voices on tape. Voices that by all rational thought shouldn't be there. So some people began to study and catalog these voices, and they 
evolved into what's been called, what's now called EDP or electronic voice phenomenon. And Friedrich Jürgensen was one of the pioneers in this work. He was out taping birth songs one day, and one of the messages, well, one message came from his mother, said, Friedel, my fr little Friedel, can you hear me? Uh, Friedel's a nickname for Friedrich. Um, these are other voices too. Uh, one, voice, one voice said, bird songs in the night. Because um, when they look at our world, it seems kind of dark here because of the very dense vibration here on Earth. In any case, Jörg Jürgensen became a very well-known pioneer in EDP, often regarded as like the father of EDP. And uh, after he died, he continued the work. He died in 1987. And, and several years later, he sent this picture to Adolf Holmes. And the way it came through was kind of interesting. Adolf Holmes would wake up in a trance-like state some morning. He was, he was a very psychically gifted man. And when he woke up in this trance, he's, that's when he had his best results at school night. So on his one morning, he brought the color TV out and turned it on, which was unusual. He usually worked with his black and white television. And then he set up the video camera in front of the TV. And as soon as he turned on both units, this picture of Friedrich Jürgensen showed up on Adolf Holmes television screen. He started talking to the TV, as he always does, hoping that this was a voice contact. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. In this case, there was a little voice contact that came through, but there was a loud cracking sound in the next moon. So when the voice went away off this television, he turned off the TV and the video camera, and he went next door to the next room. He found his uh, computer had been turned on by itself, and the printer had been turned on, and that was a printout in the printer. And it said, this is Friedel from Sweden. Um, I'm going to try to paraphrase the message if I can. So it's kind of important. He said, uh, spread this message as far and wide as you can. Uh, we have a difficult time contacting the earth because minds have been closed off to the spiritual. And we get a, kind of a new awakening among humans. To, so we go from the bridges. He said, I sent this picture to you in 1991 of your time, but it arrives today in 1994, and for these three years it's been lost in the quantum of timelessness and spacelessness, which is an unusual thing. This is the kind of insights we're getting from ITC, what their world is like. Uh, time is nebulous, it's kind of an illusion of our world. And so they'll send us something, and it will not arrive in our world until the conditions are right. For example, Adolf Holmes's trance-like state that morning, also the use of the uh, technology, the color TV and the video camera. All those conditions came together and your contact came through. So this is for your difference in the lifetime, and you can see the resemblance. Uh, he's an older man of the lifetime, and uh, pretty much at the prime of life in my spirit of picture. Uh, this is one of my favorite ITC contacts of all time. This is an ethereal being or an angel. There. And there are seven of them who've been working with us since 1995, or actually a little bit before that. And they're, they are the ones who make these more enhanced or elaborate forms of ITC characters as possible. Um, they say that they've never been in physical bodies. They don't have a gender. Um, And they don't have the skin and the ego that we have on Earth. These things give us the illusion of individuality. So without those illusions, they live together in clusters in the ethereal realm, um, very tightly knit groups of animals left together. They come apart once in a while to do individual tasks and functions and projects, but then they always come back together where they feel most comfortable. And uh, I think I didn't even say this, but I believe this is one of the seven also, this ethereal-like form of bacteria. And you can see why people that attribute them with winds uh, and can see the wind-like energy emanations from this ethereal being. But they say that they don't really have winds. It's just a, well, wow. kind of a creative thing that artists conveyed some time ago. Well, and this is also my favorite contact. Uh, they left a message on a telephone answering device before um, 
our second meeting, I, I helped establish an international panel of scientists and researchers in 1995. We met in Dartington, England, and forged a constitution and a purpose, which was to pursue ITC contacts uh, in a moral, ethical way. And they said, the ethereal thing is that because of that commitment and other factors also, they decided to work with us, with our group. And um, our second meeting was going to be held in Terrytown, New York. And this message came on telephone answering device about a week before our meeting. It's about three minutes long, and I'm just going to play a short excerpt of it here so you get the idea of what their voice sounds like when they manufacture a voice that we can understand. Uh, it's really an ethereal sounding voice, a little bit male, a little bit female. Um, it's a beautiful voice, I think. In which humanity would have dripped up the chain to your dominance and quality. A future in which it will be able to establish fruitful and durable relationship with the life that we know was not there. So that, that was kind of a key part of the message. They say this is the seventh time that we accompany and guide you on your progress. And uh, if we have time today, I'm going to get into that. And explaining what they're talking about, what those other six times were, and why they choose this as the seventh time. So my trip to Europe was pretty expanding for me. I, uh, um, I was just amazed by what's going on in our world and other worlds. And so when I got home in Europe, where you suppose I did, I jumped in the car, looked up from the car, went to Radio Shack, I bought three broadband radios, a tape recorder, and songs from my I think I had to experiment. I, uh, I get up at three or four in the morning every day and I set up a bowl of fruit and some water early for breakfast and I'd start talking to the radios. Or actually I'd talk to invisible friends beyond the radios and beyond our world, but still right there beside me. And I'll, I'll explain how that works. So we all kind of know how that works. To, I'll explain it in some detail in just a moment. But it wasn't long in my experiments before I started getting these tiny little EDT voices on tape. They typically last one to two seconds, and you can't hear them when they're coming through. It's only when you play back tape that you can hear these little voices. But occasionally I'd get loud, clear voices that would break through the radio sounds, and this, that's what ITC is about. It's, these are called direct voices. And this is an example of where one of the spirits says, time just asses here. I am still a dark hatcher. Idiot. Oh, ten or over. Susan. Okay, the contacts that I've received through the telephone and, um, and through the tape recorder also, through the radio sounds. It's usually the voice of Constantine Raudai. Constantine Raudai was a Latvian psychologist who taught psychology at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. And he was like me in some ways. He was skeptical of all his talk of the afterlife, and especially communication with the afterlife, until he went to visit Jurgensen back in the early 1970s, uh, or late 1960s. and. Uh, he was amazed at these little voices on tape. So he became fully immersed in the work too. And by the time he died in 1974, he had gathered over 70,000 of the voices on tape. Uh, many of them under very strict laboratory conditions. He had scientists <laughs> sitting in on the experiments and uh, very tightly controlled experiments. Voices that come through his radio sounds all the time. And again, when he died, he decided to continue to work from the other side, to resume the work. So, talking about job security. Research in LA, I out there. I mean, I was just shooting. Uh, he's a fellow who called me on the phone a number of times, and sometimes we would, he would give me technical advice from my equipment. Sometimes um, we would just talk philosophically. And that's what was happening in this phone call. It lasted. Uh, almost 15 minutes, and um, this is about a two or three minute excerpt from that telephone organization. It's not easy, of course, to develop 
the social systems they're based on the dark hierarchy. Then tried to move by the Christmas because uh, he bathed it and spurred and planted it in the world and would have to do with it. He, then, sorry, talking, then I had the other few on several room and then I'll be done because it found me for the patent costs. But then, uh, what we're trying to establish with then I think, is uh, more network out of which is as opposed to a hierarchical or bureaucratic type organization. A network without formal structure. I think that can be done maybe with the internet. That is the thing you could call it to you once or two. The that main odd is natural that you are one big dot and I've left it down then. Drink to the hand before this they done. There were a birthless model. I think I need from them. Big dog, Dan, <laughs> Roman Kale. So what he was telling us, um, our group, was that they monitor us on the computer-like screen on their side of the veil. They have a lot of super high-tech equipment that we can't even imagine here yet. Uh, and they see us all as points on an image. All the numbers of minutes are in it for instrumental transcuting. There were lines connecting us, representing park connections, I believe. and. There were several members who had formed a group who were kind of considered to be key members, and only the, those people could uh, branch out and bring in them some of the groups. How do you force the means that you recorded this? Okay, this actually came through a telephone, all ringing just in, as it normally would, and I picked it up, and uh, it's in my spirit friend. And by then, the first time they called, uh, I didn't have caller ID, I didn't have recording equipment or anything, I could just startle me and I literally talked for, actually I didn't even talk, I just listened to him talk for about five seconds and communication broke up. After that I bought uh, recorders from all of every house in the phone, every phone in the house. And just, uh, so whenever I get a spirit phone call, I just press the record button right away. And what does caller ID say? On the area the caller ID says. <laughs> I don't understand. It's his mind blowing. And uh, the reason we know this was not a fake call is because in America, we cannot have uh, our phones traced automatically by the phone company um, because the law requires that it has to be some kind of a life threatening situation in the land. Something like that, and then law enforcement would get involved and trace the phone calls. But in Europe, you can arrange with Deutsche Telekom or one of the other communications companies and have all your calls traced. So my recent my friend and uh, actually friends in Luxembourg and Germany would have their phones traced for a period of three months. They'd, they'd get phone calls from stir friends because these were dedicated lines they had on their own, unlisted numbers, nobody, not even their f colleagues knew the numbers. Uh, so we'd get these spirit phone calls. And at the end of the three months, Boris Telecom would come back and say, we report to you that there have been no phone calls coming through this line the last three months. So it um, verifies what we tend to believe about the spirit worlds is they're all right here around us and always with our world. And so they don't have to contact us through public phone networks. They actually come into our home, they come into our labs, they set up their equipment and pins their energies directly onto our equipment. And that's how they make these Contacts out. So, this is still real mind boggling to most people. And uh, uh, what's needed today is a kind of a simple technique that allows fairly compelling contacts to happen on a regular basis in the mixed crowd. And that's where the illuminator comes in. That's the box in my lab that I now have in Diane's house. And basically, it has two fans in it, one on the top, one on the bottom. In the middle, there's a plexiglass barrel. This uh, has liquid-filled rings along the side of the barrel. And the liquid has been programmed. It's a water-based liquid. It's been programmed the way that we program crystal and tension and uh, uh, love and the emotions. You know. And so when the fans blow, they they're counter-rotating fans, so they create a vortex of energy within like a hurry, like a little tornado inside 
the plexiglass barrel. And somehow between the uh, liquid filled rings and the vortex, it creates this very powerful field of subtle energy. People who are sensitive can often feel a kind of a bristling or tingling sensation when they're in the presence of a uh, and We don't know much about how it's created other than what I just said. Um, but I do know that, and my colleagues know also, that if we're in the field illuminator and somebody else is there and we take a picture of them with a Polaroid camera, very often we get the most amazing spirit faces on film. Uh, just like this picture, this is a friend of ours named Mimi who lives in California. She used to live in New, uh, New Jersey. On the left, you can see the way she actually looks. On the right, you can see an older woman kind of superimposed on the lower part of her face. And that's her mother. And Debbie Alberti um, was in Pennsylvania. Her husband, John, died of a massive heart attack during a tennis game. And uh, she wrote to me, we had a mutual friend named Steve Martin, Dr. Steve Martin, he's a psychologist in New York. And uh, he told a couple about me before John had died, so they were aware of my work a little bit. So after John died, Debbie was really going through a tough greeting time, and she contacted me and said she needs some kind of uh, proof, even though she knows there's an afterlife, she just needed something tangible to hold on to. So uh, that spring, and all that summer, I uh, gave a workshop at the Edgar Casey Center in New York City, the ARE Center in New York City. Debbie showed up, and we took a series of pictures of Debbie, and one of them, them came out fairly clear like this one. But in one of them, her husband John was superimposed very clearly over her strokes. And uh, as we looked at more closely, we realized it was actually two faces divided diagonally down the, down the middle. And that she recognized very clearly as her husband John from lifetime. You can see the resemblance. He was clean shaven. And the other picture, it took me several weeks to figure out. I'm pretty sure it's a picture of Edgar, it's the face of Edgar Casey. Uh, odd enough face there to be sure, and we, we, haven't, we didn't rip, so it's a easier. Most of us, after we die, we shed the physical body and we awaken in this current ice world. All it takes is basically decent living, you know, uh, basic uh, the happiness of the way things are, with life, some treating out of people in a decent manner. And that creates a fine vibration within us that takes us to this beautiful paradise world. Um, she did work kind of steep with a lot of resentment or negativity through their lives. And if they died before they reconcile, sometimes they wind up in this kind of dismal, gray, dark place for a while. It's not the eternal hell of brimstone fire that we hear about from fundamentalist Christianity. It's basically just a uh, troubled place for there are a lot of confused souls. And there are always people from these finer realms of existence who make constant trips down in here on mission work. They uh, wait for people to go through their patterns of negative thinking, and then they bring them up to this paradise world to be resuscitated and re kind of heal in this huge hospital-like uh, buildings. They have actual buildings. And in a paradise world, they have everything we have on Earth and a lot, lot more. Uh, some people, they have recreation centers where you can do incredible things. And, uh, people say they love the paradise world so much they never want to leave. But there's always a little voice inside that says, no, you've got to go back to Earth for another lifetime. Or they can work with an ascended master to raise their vibration, purify their thoughts and their attitudes, and raise to their uh, rise to these finer levels of spirit beyond form and structure. And when you get to those places, thousands of years on Earth can pass by a snap of the finger. It's just amazing. Uh, our spirit friends, those who are a spirit group, are currently residing in this astral realm. And they use their equipment to contact us, but they can't do that without the facilitating abilities of these ethereal beings, these angels that I shared a little information of earlier. They're the ones who have the really the knowledge and the power to bridge the dimensions and make these miraculous contacts happen. And when people from this realm visit these finer realms of existence, they say that being among the ethereal beings is like standing before a bank of living consumer computers that exchange oceans of information instantly. 
Um, they said that they can go into this, uh, like a reverie, a state of total bliss and meditate. And years and years go by on earth, but they sometimes have to be shaken back by our desire to, to work with them. We think about them and so they're kind of shaken under a reverie and they come back down to the paradise world so they can continue working with us. And it's not something that traps them to the earth. It's something they've chosen to do on the other side for the sake of our world. Versus, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult world. There are a lot of, uh, well, I'll talk, if we have time, I'll talk about that too. But are there any other questions or comments about this? Yeah, you mentioned it's a parrot-based world. I mean, is that the equivalent to the astral realm? Uh, some people break up the astral realm into the lower astral, the hill astral, and the higher astral. And the dismal realm is what I call a lower astral. And the middle and the higher astral planes are what I'm referring to as the paradise world. It's really a nice existence. So I'd like your much choice. So it's saying again, the middle. You said, say you critique what you just said. Oh, um, the, ast the higher astral. The higher astral realm is also, it's also we call the fifth level by Friedrich Myers. Um, is that the paradise? That's the paradise, that's the really the subtlest and finest part of the paradise world. The middle astral is also kind of like a paradise. It's much like the earth, not quite as much of a paradise as the higher astral. I, I just month, month, month those two together and three astral. Are there any other comments or questions about anything I thought if I still follow the hand K A D U? Were you given pop were you given instructions to make to the early? Were you given instructions from some were, some place uh, that enabled you to make the illuminator? No, all I got was permission from my wife said I was <laughs> on money. <laughs> So uh, there was a fellow in Michigan, that was through Michigan, who uh, named Patrick Richard, Sid and Gulps, and Ian Neighbors. And uh, there's, I think there's eight or nine of them on land in the world right now. No, uh, they're almost all used for healing purposes. Um, everybody who owns one's an energy huber. And this creates kind of a, a healing feel. People say they feel better they did and so lessening its hunting wellnesses and things. They're also it's used as kind of a hand kicking the name of the word where it's like I'm just only test yes or no on something. But if you take a picture of a person when they use it in their research, if the person comes out clear at all, it's called hearing some the medicine they're holding in their hand is good for them. If it's some negative medicine, some powerful that will come out incoherent, sometimes I'll see stir phases. But that's their intention for the later. My intention has always been to invite my spirit team to come in and show, help show spirit guys and muffins. And so my way works too. But I'm the, I'm the only one who uses mine full time by ITC. How many you built was an illuminator you needed and that's a little kind of device? Or can you tinker with it and make it more effective? And how does it work also? Okay. Uh, all I know is it creates a field. And that's the feel is what allows them to manifest. They seem the spirit comes in close and they seem to absorb some more ectoplasmic substance. They become dense enough to show it on the film. Uh, what was your question? Um, how do you know that this was the right machine or you was? I went to the ICM conference, the International Society for the Study of Soul Energy Medicine, uh, being over going here. I ran into Jack Slippy, who owns one of these devices, and I, I saw a poor picture of a uh, white woman with a black man. So we goes over her face. Very fair, but Colonel was a black woman and a black woman. And he showed me some of the other pictures, too, very clearly different faces. And uh, sometimes we see pictures of loved ones, like a father sliming in the only era. So I knew right away that these were spirit faces. While none of the researchers using the illuminator for time and all of that, I knew that's what it was, so I just bought me the lab and put this. It's this information that you have about the astral body information and came through um, one of your communication twice. Well, actually, I received most of my information from George Meek. He had studied some of these esoterics, the sound of his album, made some made it different. Esoteric apes, and they, they consolidate a lot of that inf information into a nice model from celestial and cosmic binds all the way down to the 
lower astral planes and the physical plane. And um, talked about the different bodies we have, the uh, physical body, the astral body, and the ethereal body that are all inside of us. And um, our spirit group more or less verified that it was more or less legitimate. But they said it's a simplification. There's no way to describe these worlds in a way that um, would be accurate in human terms because we just don't, we don't have the understanding and the vocabulary to describe what's really happening. We said it's firmly accurate. Uh, I was wondering, I know that <clears throat> I've experienced for years when my husband died at a certain time for Fraun were Dorin, that I've you in a way. I must okay. That's it. Too. That was just quite cute. Okay, I okay, wasn't supposed to do that. The second pilot. At a certain time of the day, usually early in the morning, the fall would ring. But it wasn't a normal vibration ring if they get the, the fall. And yeah, I, and I had this uh, friend of mine, yes, the girl loved one died. He called life with, with her. And somebody else I know, uh, and then he has a, uh, as a relative of mine, going to play pranks and then with, 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 uh, sign the put net in me. Um, can you explain anything about that, um, ability, how, how it just happened, why it's a day or I'm doing That's a complicated, uh, did everybody hear what she was asking? Not she said that after her husband died, um, a lot of anomalies, electronic anomalies began to happen in her house. The flashing lights, telephone calls with nobody on them and different things like that. And she was wondering how that sort, that sort of thing happens. And what, what seems to be the case is, like I said, all the worlds of spirit are superimposed over our own. And, uh, uh, these people move in and out of our lives constantly, especially loved ones who left here recently. They spend a lot of time at home with their loved ones, just sharing moments, you know, before they move on. And um, there's every physical feeling in the arm world as a template, like a spiritual template in the solar realm. So when we have a light switch on the wall, there's also a light switch in solar realms, and they can actually go up to the light switch and start moving in. And if it's, um, if there's enough emotional connection, I think, or something like that, they can actually change not only their template, but also change things in our world. That's not exactly how it happens, but that's kind of how it seems to happen from their world. Does that kind of make sense? Is that, does that, does that answer your question? Uh, I believe so, but I'm not that cut them quick. I was just interested in what you saw. Thank you. I think. Yeah, this. That's my take on it. And who clocks tapping and seeing the deal things that I have And the death part in this. What was that? Clocks stop. Clocks? Or is that not necessarily? Call me a second side. Yeah, I think all sorts of electronic equipment can be affected by them. And even in the car, they can affect the radio, they can. We've had contacts from my colleagues coming through radios while they're driving in the car. They'll just take over a radio station, basically. And uh, since this handheld mic is no longer working, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just finish the rest of my presentation, and we can maybe have questions and answers at the end. So the way I see this multidimensional omniverse, at the center of everything is what they call the source, or God, or Yahweh, or Allah, or Brahman. It's, um, it's like this perfect source of love and consciousness, which manifests as this pure, non-vibrating light. And as the light leaves the source, it begins to vibrate very fast. And the further out it goes, it vibrates slower and slower, and it manifests as everything in all various dimensions of existence. Um, and we are out, we humans are out on the very far reaches of this and like out in the trenches and the way, the way I've kind of come to look at this 
vast existence it is that um, a source is trying to spread its light and its wisdom and its love as far as it possibly can and sort of deepest, deepest reaches of dimensions. And it seems to have reached a point here where it's not easy to maintain it. Uh, the light becomes kind of dim out here where it's slow moving and dense. And so there's pockets of chaos that begin to develop, uh, a lot of negativity and darkness. Um, and so what we do, I think, on Earth, what we do when we're planning to come to Earth is we take an assignment to, uh, we all have the same basic <coughs> purpose of an existence here on Earth, which is to uh, be born, and as we grow up, learn to get in touch with our highest self, with our conscious self. And by doing that, the highest self or the soul is a part of the source. And so we can pull in all of this love and wisdom directly from the source and then move through us and we can kind of spray it out into this world through our thoughts and our words and our actions. And I think that's why we accept the job a lifetime here on Earth. And beyond that, we also have personal missions that we have to achieve on a, based on our skills, our talents, and things that we uh, have come to Earth to do from maybe from past lifetimes. Maybe. Our spirit friends tell us that there's something they call a contact field that spans in many dimensions, and it's formed by the thoughts and the attitudes of all the researchers on Earth working together on a project. And also our spirit group, uh, all of our thoughts and attitudes from both sides form this pool of consciousness that spans dimensions. And if we're all in harmony, if everyone's driven by love and trust and goodwill, then the contact field becomes clear. It's just abstract to us, but to them it's very real on the other side. They can see into our world then, they can work with our equipment. But if there's uh, negative thinking or dissonance in the food of uh, fear and envy and uh, greed and that kind of thing, then the contact field becomes cloudy. It becomes really difficult then for them to see into our world and to work with our equipment. Excuse me. So, uh, the key to ITC research is not the equipment that we're using, it's basically um, uh, the attitude, the, re the resonance that people can sustain over a period of time. And our group broke down in 1999 or 2000 because egos began to take over, as they do in human groups. Um, for a couple of months of we were getting such good contacts that one or two researchers began to question the legitimacy of the contacts. I know they were real. I knew then and I know that now that they were very real, but there were still people who were getting skeptical. And that skepticism caused about the, in the contact field to grow kind of cloudy. And then the people in Luxembourg naturally became very angry when their honesty was called into question. So they became hostile. And things just kind of grew out of control. That's the way things work in women groups. <laughs> and so it's very difficult to sustain these ITC contacts. And that's why. Uh, the future has, has to depend not on the equipment, but on our ability to learn how to sustain harmony in a group. Now I'd like to talk for a moment about my own personal uh, afterlife experiences, but I'm going to put it into a broader context. There are many types of uh, journeys beyond our world. The most basic that we all have is dreaming. Every night we go to bed and we fall asleep. And uh, we have dreams. Uh, most of these dreams are just excursions into these different worlds of spirits. And uh, when we wake up, we forget about the dream very quickly, typically. A near-death experience, of course, is when the body dies and we have an extended dream, a more lucid dream than usual, very, very lucid. We actually go to the other side. Uh, I don't know if you've seen The Ghost Whisperer. It was written by James Van Prog, a well-known psychic. And his ability is to, he can see people who are kind of stuck, but after they um, are redeemed, they can go into this light. And that's what he can see is just the light. Other psychics can go beyond the light and see, they can see the, uh, they can talk to ethereal beings, but the light is basically, for most, I believe that the light is, um, the light from this paradise world where people are supposed to be is just, when you first get there, it's a blinding light almost. It's so beautiful, but it's, it's a blinding light. It's so powerful. 
and then you get adjusted and it seems normal. And then your other life here on earth begins to fade into a dream as you get settled in on the other side. Now, whenever you move among dimensions, the place you left always fades away into a dream. And you have to, if you want to, you can keep the dream alive with your thoughts and your love for people who you left behind. But some people forget about the dream altogether and just move on. We're told that um, when atheists and skeptics die, sometimes, well, well, they usually wake up in this paradise world too, if they're indecent and all the sides is true, spiritually minded. But they no longer believe in life on earth. I think it was just a bad dream. So, <laughs> <they're still laughs> said insistent. Was it? At least they're consistent. <laughs> so AEEs are basically, that, uh, you cross over to the other side and they come back and happy, is wonderful, loving experience. And and being easy heard from other people in this group and elsewhere, you know, this is just a small taste of the intense love uh, that you're, which you feel. OBEs, of course, are very similar, except the body doesn't die. This goes to an, into a deep sleep, and you have, uh, and you can still travel uh, to other places. You probably don't wind up for a long extent on this in this paradise world, but you can go there for a while. It will be easy you can also travel to the earth and other places on earth than that. And most of dreams, of course, are like an OBE again, like a net of experience again except um, uh, the body doesn't die. And sometimes people with lucid dreams can actually wind up in this dark and visible place for a while too, and then they come back and it's kind of scary. But uh, um, it's easy to resolve. It's just kind of fake loving thoughts, and your next year is probably going to be a really nice one. And meditation, of course, is a technique of uh, keeping the, the body awake or the, let the body go to sleep, but keeping the mind awake. And then you can go to these different, different levels, meditative levels, uh, and to uh, basically commune with being with a different the five or five realms of existence. And binaural beats, uh, that's basically like the hemisync technology of Mineral Institute. You put on headphones, or sometimes in glide mask with red lights, and the sounds of the, and the lights are, are both, or just one or the other. They pulsate so that uh, the stimulating of the eye and the, or the ear uh, takes you down into finer levels of meditation so that you can learn to do in minutes or hours. What mystic sometimes takes years to learn how to do, how to achieve these finer states of consciousness. Billy. And my own journey didn't really begin until I had cancer. And when I was on the, on the operating table, it seemed like, I didn't remember this right away, but looking back, I had gone to this place, uh, it was like a high-tech lab. And uh, I remember there were a group of us, kind of a line, people waiting to get around this table. And I put my hands on the table, and they kind of got stuck there, as like they were glued to the table. And on the middle of the table was a, a device that had a, a couple of lines coming into it that were like glass, they were transparent. You could see this rainbow colored light streaming to and from both the, uh, to and from the device. And when, when my hand got stuck, I thought, well, these are not just normal energies. And everybody kind of looked at me like, duh, you know, like I was, I was there, uh, um, I kind of fell out of place. Everybody knew I was out of place, but there was nothing. You know, I think everybody else there was kind of in, living, living there. They were the inhabitants of this high-tech paradise land and the world that it was part of. And I was just kind of visiting, I guess, getting the idea. Uh, there was another dream I had uh, shortly after while I was still recovering. And again, I was in this high-tech building. It was like... Uh, I was a technical writer for most of my career, and it was like one of these big buildings. I was walking down a hallway, and everybody I saw I just felt very much at peace. Everybody was really feeling good. Yeah, so I know I was on Earth. <laughs> um, uh, and they, they, again, I felt out of place, and they, they recognized me as kind of a visitor, but I, I felt welcome that I was still feeling out of place. 
Okay. My first really near-death experience was this one I felt. Uh, I was in this beautiful place and I just felt this total love. And when I came back, I remember I could see the love within people. It was like everybody was this perfect love. And then there was a little, there's a kind of a viscous shell or membrane, I guess, of fear that was around them. But uh, <coughs> the love was so powerful and it seemed like it would easily be able to wash away a lot of fear. It was in this little shell that people had. And when I got back, uh, when I got back from these weavings on the other side, um, I kind of woke up knowing that I had these habits in this lifetime that I had to contend with. Um, it seemed to be my biggest obstacle to getting done what I had to do all alive, and just overcoming these habits. And occasionally I'll, I'll meditate. This happened, probably started happening about six years after my uh, surgery, after I started giving in all the 9TC, I'd be meditating or dozing or sleeping, usually kind of dozing or daydreaming, and uh, I would, these stuck souls would be right in front of me. I'd just see them, and I would just kind of uh, see my eyes off to the side, I'd bring them in close, or I'd somehow shine a light, not not a light, so to speak, but I made it so, uh, I was kind of like my intercessor between these guys out here and the stuck soul. And I could actually see the soul being um, accompanied by the guys up to this fine level of existence. So this began to happen spontaneously to me on a number of occasions. I guess it's called redemption work or rescue work or something like that. But I know there are, I've talked to a lot of other people who have similar experiences. It's just, um, there are a lot of us on Earth Eanes right now to do that kind of work. Why there are so many people stuck in this dismal realm, and it's so much easier for the finer guys in the spirits to help these people if we on Earth can participate through prayer and the uh, uh, awareness of the plight, because we can provide some kind of light or um, enlightenment on the situation, so that the guys, a lot of times. These guys who come from higher levels down to the physical realm to do their rescue work, they find these people who are stuck in adders, and they don't even recognize that there's anybody around them. It's just kind of stuck. But if we can participate with some kind of prayer or meditation, focused meditation, we can kind of wake them up out of their dream, and they'll come look around, and they'll see these guys around them, and then they can be rescued. So it sometimes helps for us to help out in that way. So there are a lot of people on Earth who are doing that, that there are a lot more to being used also. Uh, this is the CD I produced with the Muro Institute. It, um, it has the hemisync sounds, which kind of bring you into a meditative state. It takes you on a heart meditation first, which is like the seat of the soul. So from the heart, you can uh, get in touch with the source and can bring all this love to them and we connect with the loved ones, and we can connect with the source and then spray that light out into the world and bring, can, uh, convert the rumor and into a temple of light just by bringing all this love through us from the source. And then we take a kind of a journey to the paradise worlds where most of us awaken after we die and we kind of see what that's like. And um, the, one of the purposes of the CD, in fact, is to get us acclimated to going to this paradise world so that after we die, we just go there automatically. It's just an automatic thing. Uh, typically, I would do a five-minute meditation, but I don't think we have time if I'm going to cover this other information. And uh, so let's move on to... I'm going to show you now a series of pictures we've gotten from the other side to show a glimpse of this paradise world. Uh, there's the fellow on the left is Alexander Fuget in his lifetime. And uh, on the right, this is a picture that he sent from the other side. He said that he was visiting the snow land of this paradise. There's also a summer land, but this snow land had a lot of reindeer. And uh, um, along with this, he sent a letter to his mother, a little note to his mother. 
Uh, the fellow on the left and the young woman on the right, both, all three of these people have died in uh, their 30s, I guess, or 40s, and they became good friends after they crossed over. This one I showed you, this is Jeanette Neek and her daughter Nancy Carroll. <laughs> and uh, this is a friend of the researchers who uh, had died, this old one, and now she's at the prime of life. Prime of life. And uh, she's kind of coming out of this, what they call the river of eternity. Ezra Brown, up in the top left, he died as a young, uh, and had a lesson, I guess, about 11 or 13, about 13 years old, I think. He had uh, leukemia. His mother was Chinese, his father was German. And when he crossed over, uh, his parents got him involved in this EDP work. They started experimenting with a tape recorder. And they got a little voice that said, I have long hair. And then that, after a few, he lost all his hair. So now I'm in the side of beautiful long hair. And then it wasn't long after that that he sent a picture of himself through the computer in Luxembourg. And the horses had belonged to the researcher in Luxembourg named Maggie. Um, King was one of her horses who had died. So sometimes our spirit group got created and sent several pictures to different people. Uh, this is a friend of the researchers named Bert Ernst Max, whose wife Margaret had died a couple years earlier. After he died, he sent this picture of himself working with a computer terminal. Our background is what, he called it, what they call the river of eternity. It's this huge river that flows through this paradise world. You walk up to the river, you scoop up a handful of this. It's a little thicker than water, and you take a drink, and you're totally revitalized. If you drop the water, your hand uh, is totally dry. It's not like water on our heat. Uh, it's warm and energizing and revitalizing fluid that people can just drink to get recharged. When you don't have to do that, you can, just by breathing the air in this paradise world, you're constantly revitalized. You have a body exactly like the physical body, cell by cell. It's the uh, exact replication, but it's at the prime of life. And if you get injured in the astral body, it quickly heals, it never gets sick. It's just a perfect existence. It's just incredible. And he sent a letter along with this picture saying that he and Margaret now enjoy their young bodies along the banks of the river eternity. So, just amazing. This is a young couple, again, known by the researchers who uh, were now in the Zoragar life from the other side. This is a girl named Anne Vignet, the French girl who died in 1922 at age 11. And um, she said that when she, she crossed over, she's become kind of in charge of a project to uh, reduce suffering and pain among children on earth, on a newborn life. Not unborn life, but newborn life. She made that point clear. Well, this is a picture that they sent of Anne Gignet now as a young woman on the other side, through who came through a computer in Luxembourg at about the same time that this picture came through a television in Germany. They would sometimes get these cross contacts like this to help give us uh, um, assurance that these are legitimate contacts. Something like this could be hoaxed by somebody on Earth. You know, but this contact was so amazing that uh, our natural reaction would be, this got to be a hoax. Somebody planted this picture with a computer. Somebody has created this picture on TV. But since they came through at the same time at different locations, um, we know that uh, that was either a concerted effort against these two colleagues who didn't particularly like each other. It was our story group choreographing these cross contacts. This is Romy Schneider in the middle, and a friend of hers is a young African prince. Uh, and they're kind of enjoying a picture of the earth for Shinra camera. This is uh, Ferris Celsus and father of holistic medicine. And uh, this is the way he looks now, his young, spirit body, in a Swiss like Alpine setting. This is a guy named Jan Futze, who was a. Uh, uh, healer for the emperor of China on the second century BC, I think, or the second century AD, I can't remember exactly. Um, his job was to go around the countryside and uh, examine psychics who were affecting the people, you know, that he had determined whether they were in touch with these finer levels of spirit that could provide healing to the people 
or if they were just in touch with uh, troubled spirits who were stirring up more troubles here on Earth. And that was his job to kind of uh, screen the different mediums who were at work in China back then. This is also a picture of the same man who came through a television set in Germany. And this is an African man, Wele Mofanga, who uh, was eaten by a lion, was killed by an African lion. And uh, he became a good friend of Richard Francis Burton, an English um, writer and an adventure, an explorer who would travel the world. And uh, now that he's on the other side, Richard Francis Burton goes out exploring the spirit world, trying to find out what's out there. And then he reports back to us sometimes what he's found. And Voila Mabanga has become his good friend and a scout for his journeys. This is one of the seven ethereal beings we were told. He's kind of a advanced nature spirit, not like a uh, typical nature spirit on Earth, but someone who was, a close, was, who was very close to nature in many worlds. This is the home of Klaus Schreiber, a uh, fellow a researcher in Germany, you know, pioneers in TV, ITC. And after he died, he said he lived in this beautiful forest hole in And this is the temple that Jules Verne awakened in after he died. Oui, oui. This is a researcher named uh, Hannah Bushbeck, a German researcher who died as an old woman, came through a couple of years later and was just glowing and radiant about being on the other side in this paradise world. And this is a 19th, 19th century chemist named Henry Sinclair de Bill, who made aluminum useful in industry, among many other accomplishments during his lifetime. He was a famous scientist back then. And he's one of the people in science who joined the spirit group on the other side to contact us. And this is a radio contact that was sent by Henry Sinclair de Bill, also. So I think I'll uh, open the uh, session up to questions and answers and the discussion now. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to? Yes, we'll have to speak up at the yeah. end. Is English the universal language that the experience world talks to? Ah, okay. I have a question. Okay. She asked if uh, English is the universal language over there. And uh, they actually, almost all of the contacts came through in German or Luxembourgish or French. Uh, sometimes they would speak Swedish or whatever language. Like you said, they were trying to address somebody. They would speak in their language. And these ethereal things especially could speak in any language imaginable. They could speak in Swahili if they wanted to. Uh, our spirit friends in the astral realm usually just spoke in the languages they were accustomed to on Earth. Rod I have spoke a little bit of English, but he spoke a lot of German and Swedish and Latvian. So uh, that's Constantine, a the guy who called him Fallen. So he usually spoke in German, but when he was talking to me, I'm uh, linguistically challenged as most Americans are, so they always have to speak to me in English. Yeah. Um, Do they have an accent? Do they have an accent? Yeah, if they had an accent on Earth, they seemed to carry that over when they came back down in level to work with us. It seems like a lot of patterns that we have uh, on Earth, as we ascend to final levels, we lose those patterns. As we come back down toward the physical realm, we, those patterns come back. Well, they become a part of our spirit. Yeah. And one of the first things you showed is someone, a spirit was speaking to you and said something about the dangers of drugs. Was that in reference, do you think, to um, narcotic drugs or prescription drugs, or what, what do you know about that? Um, 
Yeah, I did a cynic star on him with drugs. I grew up through the 60s and 70s, and I was a Navy in, the, in Vietnam in the like 73, 74. There was a lot of drug use going on. And I think that they were talking about mostly people who do a lot of drugs habitually and addictively. Um, it could be a prescription, it could be recreational, whatever. Um, the trouble is your, your body, the dopamine that we have in our brain, um, it creates these patterns of behavior that we you become accustomed to here on Earth. And if we carry those patterns to the other side, it can be kind of frustrating because we don't have the same drugs and the same hormones in our mind to uh, facilitate these patterns, especially with drugs and alcohol, which kind of blow up the dopamine and uh, completely it's just hijacked the whole dopamine reward system, you know. But there's no drugs on the other side to satisfy those patterns that are those cravings that we have. So it becomes a frustrating existence for a while. And sometimes people, because of that craving, they become dense in their spirit, come close to the earth and get in with addicts and alcoholics that are on earth and uh, so they can continue to enjoy the buzz. So they resist going to this paradise world because the addictions hold them back. So it's, they, he was basically telling us um, it's good to overcome those patterns before we leave the earth. We can. Otherwise, we have to go through this extended recuperation period, the rehabilitation period on the other side. Same as with trolls here, I guess. Do they give advice about future attempts? Like, I'm thinking like 2012. Was it? Do they give advice on future events? Or do they ever talk about the future? I don't know. Do they talk about the future? Oh. Uh, they say that the future is kind of nebulous to them. It, it, it's what they call fields of possibility Hustle. based on what we do on Earth. In fact, this is a good, well, I'll tell you a couple of things they told us. The, the head of this time stream laboratory on the other side said just, the hardest thing she had to contend with once she died was to, one of, the, one of the hardest things was to observe time as a bodily substance. It took me a while to figure out what she was talking about, you know. Uh, there is a little tunnel over there where they kind of unfold this uh, simultaneously. But when they observe us on Earth, they see by the bodily changes going on, and that's how they know the time is in their existence. They also said, um, but there are many parallel worlds with our world, uh, many parallel universes, physical universes, so that uh, there are certain key points in the history on Earth where different fields of possibility break off into other areas. There's one world where Hitler was, uh, he actually took over the world. There's other ones where he was very quickly defeated. And so Hitler was one of these points, I guess, where things branched out into different, and there Different things throughout history have evolved that cause many different parallel universes to exist. They exist now. Uh, is there a study uh, that could uh, prove or disprove whether the different lines a person has led or thinks they have led? Do we believe anything? Steve? Well, no. You know, I can't think of any good solid evidence for after reincarnation and uh, multiple lives. Oh, I know what happens. I've heard it from so many sources. Uh, I don't know of any good solid evidence of that other than um, psychic messages that, that might come through two or three different mediums who say the same thing or talk about the same life of a person. But even that could be just an attached entity that they're, you know, so I. There's no really good solid scientific evidence that I know of. Thank you. Here. What, why do these spirit faces are superimposed on a living person? Why don't they stand next to them? You know, why do you have to kind of look at the face? Like, so you know, you think, <laughs> but is there, do you, have you figured that out? Yeah, I think all, all, all I can figure is that I think they may up the extra substance we have, and they absorb that into their body, and that's, they become solid enough. And out here, I guess it's harder to absorb it. Okay. What were the so many times that the angels spoke in your head? You mentioned that you were say something about that. What was that? I thought that one ethereal being mentioned this is the seven. How many is it? Start yes. 
Okay, I, I haven't much of slides. That was a mix. I was going to do a lot of time, but I'm, I'll just go through it real quickly without the slides. They said that uh, they have come close to our world on six different occasions since Atlantis. <laughs> the civilization of Atlantis, actually, the last island fell around 1220 BC, which seems a lot more recent than most of us would believe. The fifth would be told us. Uh, the King's Island was near. Um, it was named Basile, that was near the island of Helgoland off the coast of Germany and Denmark. And uh, so since then, there have been six times when uh, it come close to our world, apparently. The one first one, there's a temple called Sophus, which is uh, located at the same place where Babylon emerged centuries later. And so I think Babylon is the second one, and they didn't tell us the third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth ones. But I think the sixth was probably the Hebrews, the uh, uh, Jews. I think they were that chosen race the sixth time. And I think they're here now for the seventh time. And I was, I've been wondering, who are they going to... And the, the purpose of it, they come to the earth at times when humanity has reached kind of a crossroads, when we either ascend to achieve... Um, lasting relationship with, if, with these ethereal beings so they can just have light streaming into our world, you know, or we can plunge into another dark period. And I think that's what we've done all six times because we're human, you know, we uh, get to this point and then we just kind of plunge into our egos and personalities which boil off into wars, you know, and different things. And um, so they're here for the seventh time. I think they have a lot more hope this time because they're not choosing one civilization, I think the seven of people are, is going to be all of mankind because we have the technology to allow that to happen. We can communicate with anyone in the world, and uh, I think they're going to give us some help in overcoming our innate obstacles. You know, the, what I'm talking about is the dopamine things. That science is now found finding that dopamine uh, is triggering the brain. Well, they know it's triggering the brain to give us a flush of ecstasy, basically, and it happens at times, typically when we've done things that perpetuate our survival, like um, uh, sex for mating, or eating for food, you know, for sustenance, they're now finding that it's also triggered by violence, because by aggressive behavior, because that's what we needed at one time to protect what we had, protect ourselves from aggressive animals and stuff and other people. So, they're finding that this dopamine is uh, part of our brain that's Basically, it gives us rewards for kind of foul behavior, you know, the um, dozing and uh, brawling and gluttony and everything that's all of our bad habits a lot of times are the result of these dopamine pathways we have in the brain. So we can learn to control those, which we've learned to do through meditation and prayer and uh, different methods like that. But if we could also use maybe brain implants to learn to stimulate us when we do altruistic kind of behavior, you know. That's what I think these ethereal things are looking, they want us to come up with solutions so we can become more aligned with them, and then they can help convert this world to a paradise, which is the project that they've been talking about to us. It's uh, converting our world to a project. They said there used to be a planet between Mars and Jupiter called Marta, or Eden. This is getting back to the beginning of the project, and also to uh, everything that you just asked. And this Eden was inhabited by superhumans, and it was a very nice world. And their technology got out of hand and grew that kind of up. They came in the asteroids built between Mars and Jupiter, and became comets, became all sorts of things that uh, basically shrapnel from this explosion. And Paul, the moon, and the planets, that's where all the craters came from. But before they destroyed their planet, they colonized the Earth. And over time, after the destruction of Marduk or Eden, they crossbred with primitive hominids on Earth. And in order to take up a human that would be uh, uh, wise and brilliant enough to make a paradise of our world, but also tough and rugged enough and mean enough to survive it in this very difficult ecosystem. And modern demons are kind of the best thing they came up with. We've tried Neanderthals and Astral Pithecus and giants and dwarves, all kinds of different people over the centuries and millennia. But we're the ones they've, they seem to have some faith in if we can just overcome the egos and the hormones. So I think that's all I have time for. Thank you all for coming. And, uh...
Uh, we are so lonely, so we'll sir. We're so lucky to um, have had you here. This is probably like, yeah, I'm but it's one of the that we're in the end, well, they're not in. Um, uh, I still have, uh, is Linda Maritain here? Linda, are you here? You are, speak now. <laughs> because uh, I got two places left for a session with, with Mark on Monday. One is at 4.30 and one is at 3 o'clock. So if you're interested in either one of those sessions, see me after the lecture now. Uh, we are going to Ruby's and can, we can continue. And if you're having a private session, you can you know, talk to him some more at that time to get more information. Um, next month is John Terrell. John, are you here still? John in the back will be our speaker next month. And uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it very much. And uh, it's our 10th anniversary next month. So, please for that great occasion. Um, also, take your trash and have a. Have a <laughs> uh,